All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take 1 Samuel chapter 6, and we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant is returned to Israel. So how will the Philistines get rid of the Ark of the Covenant? We'll take the first six verses. The priests of the Philistines suggest a way to relieve themselves of the burden of the Ark. In the last chapter, uh, when the Philistines got the Ark, it took out their pagan god, the statue Dagon, and everyone got hemorrhoids. And so now they're trying to play hot potato with this thing to get rid of it and return it right back where it came from, rather than repenting to the Lord. All right, so the first six verses. And now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty. But by all means, return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What is the trespass offering which we shall return to him? And they answered, Five golden tumors, or hemorrhoids, and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on all your lords. Therefore you shall make images of your hemorrhoids and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lie Lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? So when the Philistines first captured the Ark of the Covenant, they thought it was a great victory. But as time went on, the Philistines began to regard the Ark as a burden and not a trophy. So why did they even keep it seven months at all? Because they were reluctant to give up such a wonderful trophy of what they at first felt was a great victory over the God of Israel. And it can take a long time before we realize the futility of resisting God. The Philistine priests had enough sense to know that they offended the Lord God. Therefore, they knew that they should do something to express their sorrow and repentance before the Lord. So, the five golden hemorrhoids and five golden rats, this specific offering recognizes that it was the Lord who brought the plague upon the Philistines. They said, we know these plagues are not accidents. We know the Lord God of Israel had caused them, and we apologize to the Lord God and ask him to turn away his anger. So we knew that the plague involved hemorrhoids in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6, 9, 12, right? The Hebrew word more accurately saying hemorrhoids. The, we were not told in 1 Samuel 5 that the plague involved rats. Some think that the hemorrhoids were a result of the bubonic plague carried by rats. Others think that the rats were a part of another plague or calamity mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. So acknowledging God's judgment is one way to give glory to the God of Israel. We often fail to give God his glory because we ignore his judgment and write it off as fate or bad luck. And the Philistines admitted that the God of Israel judged their gods and had jurisdiction over their lands. And they confessed that he was Almighty God, yet they did not worship him instead of their gods. So aware of the Exodus account, the Philistines rightly remembered that no good comes when anyone hardens their heart against the Lord. Even in a purely self-interested sense, it isn't smart to harden your heart against the Lord. Right, so the Philistines decided to return this ark to Israel, but nobody had the courage to undertake the task. So the mice, the rats, when they say like you need to make gold images of your, you know, mice and your emeralds or hemorrhoids, I can imagine the rice or the, the rats made, but I can't help but wonder who served as a model for the images of the hemorrhoids that they were gonna make. <laughs> All right, verses 7 through 9, the Philistines decide how to return the ark, including a test to see if the judgment was from God or by chance. Now, therefore, make a new cart. Take two milk cows, which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take their calves home, away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold, which you are returning to him as a trespass offering, in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go. And watch. If it goes up to the road of to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. 
So here the Philistines conducted an experiment. They thought all the calamity of the plagues was from the Lord God of Israel, but they were not 100% sure, so they devised another test. Men are always reluctant to repent, and they guard against repenting unnecessarily. The test was simple and stacked against God. By nature, two milk cows, which have never been yoked, should not pull a cart at all. Instead, they should have resisted their yokes. Additionally, they decided to take their calves home, away from them. The maternal instinct of the cows would draw them not towards the land of Israel, but back home to their own calves. The Philistines devised a test that forced the God of Israel to do something miraculous to demonstrate that he really was the cause of the plagues. So, take the Ark of the Lord and set it on the cart. God had never wanted the Ark to be transported by a cart. He wanted it carried by poles set in rings on the sides of the Ark in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. The Ark didn't have handles and was not to be carried by lifting it directly in one's hands. Instead, it was to be carried by inserting gold overlaid wood poles into gold rings at each corner of the Ark. The poles were to remain inserted in the rings and to be the source of contact with the Ark. Apart from touching the poles, it was forbidden to touch the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25, verses 12 through 15. Though this way of transporting the Ark was prohibited by law, God excused them because of their ignorance of his law, right? <laughs> you can imagine that God winked at it, uh, at it in them, both because they were ignorant of God's law to the contrary and because they had no Levites to carry it upon the shoulders. So the Philistines were wise enough to not open the Ark of the Covenant and setting the articles of gold in the Ark itself. Certainly they were curious about what was in the Ark, uh, but they didn't let their curiosity lead them into sin. And I can imagine there might have been one or two that did, and they would have seen immediately that that didn't work out so well, right? And so they wanted to know if it was possible that the tumors or hemorrhoids and the other judgments came by chance. Many people will think that things happen by chance. Some say that the world was created by chance. People who are otherwise intelligent often fall into this delusion. Jacques Monod, a biochemist, wrote, Chance alone is at the source of every innovation of all the creation in the biosphere. Pure chance, absolutely free, but blind, at the very root of the stupendous edifice of evolution. Assigning such power to chance is crazy because chance has no power. For example, when a coin is flipped, the chance will land on heads is 50%. However, the chance does not make it land on heads. Whether or not it lands heads or tails is due to the strength of the flip, the force of air currents, the air pressure as it flies through the air where it's caught, and if it's flipped over once it's caught. Chance doesn't do anything other than describe a probability. We live in a cause and effect world, and chance is not a cause, but God is a great cause. When Carl Sagan petitioned the federal government for a grant to search for intelligent life in outer space. He hoped to find it by using super sensitive instrument to pick up radio signals from distant space. When he received those radio signals, he looked for order and pattern, which would demonstrate that the signals were being transmitted by intelligent life. In the same way, the order and pattern of the whole universe demonstrates that it was fashioned by intelligent life and not by chance. Scientists detect chance in the radio signals constantly in the form of unpatterned static, but it tells them nothing. Realizing that nothing happened by chance should not make us think that every event is full of important meaning from God. Some things just happen and have no great eternal purpose that we can discern. Christians can get off track by trying to see a message from God in everything, but nothing happens by chance. We live in a cause and effect world. But wicked men will sooner believe that most uncertain and ridiculous thing than own the visible demonstration of God's power and providence. So they finally decided to put the ark on a new cart and allow the cows to walk down the road unassisted. And they would be natural for the cows to seek out their calves in verse 10. But if they headed instead for Beth Shemesh, it would be evident that God was directing them and therefore he had his, he was him that sent the plagues. The Philistines added a trespass offering too. Five Im images of the hemorrhoids or emrods in the you know Hebrew and five images of the mice. <laughs> All right, crazy chapter. All right, verses 10 through 12. Against all expectation, the cows go to the land of Israel. Then the men did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart. They shut up their calves at home, and they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and images of their hemorrhoids. Then the cows headed straight for the road at Beth Shemesh, and it went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords and the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. So they should have...
have uh, not done this, right? The cows should have resisted the yoke because they were never harnessed before, and they should head back for their Philistine homes out of the concern for their young calves. But they headed straight for the road at Beth Shemesh, and God didn't leave this up to chance. Not only were they headed straight for the road, they didn't turn aside from the right hand or the left. They didn't meander around the way. They just went straight where they were supposed to go. This is a remarkable miracle. Two cows who never pulled a cart before, either alone or together, no driver led them, yet they left home and marched the 10 miles or so to a city that they'd never been to. They left their own calves behind and went straight on a certain road, with never a wrong turn, never a stop, never turning aside into the fields to feed themselves, never turning back to feed their own calves. As the cows went on the road back to Israel, we can imagine the Israelites mourning over the loss of the ark, and perhaps at that very moment they cried out to God, grieving because they thought the glory had departed. God's glory had not left anywhere. The Israelites and the Philistines both resisted him, so the Lord found a few cows to show his glory through. So lowing as they went, this means that the cows were not especially happy. They longed for their calves at home, yet they still did the will of God. The theological word book of the Old Testament on the ancient Hebrew word gaha, translated lowing, this root indicates an intense aversion which is expressed often in punitive or adverse action. When people don't believe there is a loving God who sits enthroned in the heavens and has a good plan in our lives, you can't blame them for being afraid, for being proud, or for being miserable. But for those who believe in the God of the Bible, there's no excuse for fear, pride, or misery. God is still on his throne, and as we go forth into the world, let us believe that the movement of all things is towards the accomplishment of God's purpose. All right, verses 13 through 15. The ark is received with honor and joy at Beth Shemesh. Now the people at Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there, so they split the wood of the, car, of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, which were the articles of gold and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered the burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So they felt something like the disciples felt on the day that they saw the resurrected Jesus, because they felt they received God back to them from the dead. On this day, as they were reaping their wheat harvest between May and June, they knew the God of Israel was alive. Of course, God was never dead, never left them. But the Israelites felt as though God was dead, and they were as desperate, dis- discouraged, and hopeless as if he really were dead. According to their feelings, it was as if the Lord God of Israel had risen from the dead. You start to see a type here, a model. So after being guided for some 10 miles from the Philistine city without stopping or going from one side to the other, the ark then stopped in Israelite land at the exact field of one of the chosen men. All right, so they knew that this was the right thing to do in honor of God, split the word of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering, yet it really cost them, uh, you know, something, right? Cows and carts were expensive property. In a strict sense, their offering was against the Mosaic law. First, they offered female animals to the Lord, which was forbidden, Leviticus chapter 1 verse 3 and chapter 22 verse 19. Second, they made a burnt offering to the Lord away from the tabernacle, which violated the command in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 5 and 6. Yet, God knew both their hearts and their remarkable circumstances, and he was no doubt honored. And I think there are some types and models in that as well. The Levites took down the Ark of the Lord. The Israelites were careful to let the Levites handle the Ark, as was commanded by the law in Numbers chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 and 15. Beth Shemesh was a priestly city in Joshua chapter 21, verse 16. So priests were on hand. All right, move on to verses 16 through 18, the offering from the Philistines included with the ark. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden hemorrhoids, which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron, and the golden rats. According to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages even as far as the large stone of Abel on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua at Beth Shemesh. So they wondered if all what had happened to them while they had the ark was an accident, so they set up an elaborate and difficult test for God to fulfill, and they personally observed to see if God would indeed meet the test. Their reaction isn't recorded, but they must have been persuaded. 
All right, verse 19, the men of uh, the men of Beth Shemesh profane God's holiness. Right. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. <laughs> Looking into the Ark of the Lord was a big deal. The Ark of the Covenant was only touched and handled by specific Levites from the city of Kohath. And even they were commanded to not touch the Ark itself. In Numbers chapter 4 verse 15, the men of Beth Shemeth sinned not only by touching the Ark, but also by looking into it inappropriately. We again notice God dealt with the Israelites more strictly than he dealt with the Philistines, who just transported the Ark by the cart. God did this because the Israelites, who who had his law should have and did no better. It is sad to consider that the Philistines showed more honor to the holiness of God than the Israelites. So because of the honor and glory of God, there are things which he chooses to keep hidden, and it is wrong for men to pry into the secrets of God. Isaiah 55 verses 8 9 shows this thought. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways are your, are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We need to respect the fact that God is God, and we are not there are some things that we will just not and should not know. So the manuscript evidence is pretty clear that the number recorded originally in the text was 70, not 50,070. 70 men dead in such an incident is still a great slaughter. Um, basically, the Hebrew grammar can mean that out of 50,000 men, God struck 70 of them. We can't come to any other conclusion than the number of 50,000 is either a correction or genuine, but a gloss marginal note which has crept through the text with some oversight. That is the opinion of Kiel and uh, Delich, right? But God directed the cows and they brought the cart to the field of Joshua, an inhabitant of Beth Shemesh. The Israelites in the harvest field rejoiced to see the ark returned. However, they became curious and looked into the cart and God had to judge them. The numbers in verse 19 have created a problem for there were not 50,000 people in that little village. In Hebrew, letters are used for numbers and it is easy for a scribe to miscopy or misread a letter. It is likely that 70 men were judged instantly, certainly a great slaughter for such a small village. The problem does not affect anything crucial, but it's important that we know that God did judge their sin. How many were slain is really not a vital matter. It was still serious nonetheless, no matter how you look at it. All right, verses 20 and 21, the men of Beth Shemesh appealed to the men of kirjath Jerim to take the ark from them. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirjath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. In their disrespect for God, the men at Beth Shemesh offended the holiness of the Lord. Now they knew the Lord was holy, but it didn't make them want to be closer to God. It made them want to distance themselves from God. Right? Totally different from what we see with Naomi in the book of Ruth. The primary idea behind holiness is not mural purity, though the idea includes moral purity, but is the idea of apartness, that God is separate, different from his creation, both in his essential nature and the perfection of his attributes. When men encounter the holiness of God, they are not necessarily attracted to it. When Peter saw the holy power of Jesus, he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, in Luke chapter 5, verse 8. When the disciples on another occasion saw the holy Jesus, Jesus shining forth at the transfiguration, they were greatly afraid. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 6, when we meet the holy God, we are excited and afraid all at the same time. It's like going up on a roller coaster. You want to be there, but at the same time, you don't want to be there. Many of the thrill-seeking pleasures of our modern world are simply weak attempts to imitate the fulfillment that we can only find by meeting the holy God. So in one sense, the men of Beth Shemesh showed a bad heart in asking this question. Their question made God seem too harsh instead of showing themselves to be too disobe disobedient. So here, they seem peevishly or angrily to lay the blame of their sufferings upon God as overholy or strict of their sins. And true cause, uh, they say nothing but take care to rid their hands of the ark, which they should have retained reverently. Right? In another sense, the men at Beth Shemesh asked a good question. 
God is in fact holy and who is able indeed. Holiness is not so much achieved through our own efforts, but it is received as we are new men and women in Jesus Christ. Holiness is a part of the new man we are in Jesus Christ in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. And we are invited to be partakers, sharers of Jesus Christ's holiness in Hebrews 12, verse 10. Though God is holy, though he is apart from us, instead of building a wall around his apartness, God calls us to come to him and share his apartness, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. God calls us to be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is not so much something we have as much as it is something that it has us, right? So... From the men of Beth Shemesh, the holiness of God was a problem, and it was a problem that could be fixed by putting distance between themselves and God. Their question was not, how can we how can we be made right with the holy God? But it was, who can we give this problem to so the holiness, holiness of God is no longer a burden to us, right? It's a bad mindset. So we don't know why they picked this village of kirjath Jerim. Perhaps they had good relations with these men and thought that they would take good care of the ark. Perhaps they had bad relationships with them and they wanted the Lord to curse them. Whatever the reason, uh, the men at kirjath Jerim received the ark and it stayed there for many years until King David brought it to the city of Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6. So Hophni and Phinehas thought they could win victories by trusting the ark when their lives were wicked, and God killed them. Eli died because he had not disciplined his own sons who were dishonoring the Lord. The Philistines died because they treated Jehovah like one of their own gods. The men at Beth Shemesh died because they presumptuously looked into the ark. It does not pay to trifle with God. The Philistines were healed, and the people of Israel rejoiced. But some of the Israelite men peeked curiously into the ark, and God struck them down, killing 70. The people of Israel still were not sensitive to the holiness of God. So as a summary, this three-chapter section of 1 Samuel records a painful lesson God taught his people Israel, and through them teaches to us today. Israel had failed to treat God with respect. Even Eli permitted his own sons to defile the priesthood. The people tried to manipulate God by bringing the ark to the battlefield so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies in chapter 4 verse 3. This basically pagan view of the ark failed to sense that it was a symbol pointing to God but with no magical or divine power in and of itself. Yet the ark was associated with God and it had been set apart to God. As And as such, it was a holy thing. The Philistines discovered that Israel's God was supreme when he judged them and their God for treating the ark as a victory trophy. And when God's own people failed to show respect for the holy, they too were struck down. Why? Because Israel desperately needed to recover a sense of holiness and the power of God, right? God takes his word seriously, right? When they went peeking into the ark, they were violating something that God told them not to do. He is not Allah, right? Allah is capricious. He changes his ways. He's not set in stone. God our God, Jesus Christ, sits in perfection. When he says something, he means it, right? Just because he has died for our sins does not give us license, therefore, to sin. He accepts us despite our sin nature, but that does not permit us to disgrace the name of the king, right? If we are to be kings and priests and ambassadors of his word, representing the king in that you know, essence, that's what an ambassador does, then you're taking on the name of the king, you better do it correctly. There is great consequences. And for the believer that sits in front of the Bema seat of Christ, when we get judged for reward, not judged for sin, as the non believers, you better bet that when you took the king's name in vain, you know, emptiness, or misrepresented the king, you're going to lose reward for it, right? God takes his word seriously, and so should we. So only when the people of God honored him again could he bring his people blessing. All right, that ties up 1 Samuel chapter 6. In the next chapter, we will see Samuel as judge, and he's going to lead the nation in repentance. And the ark is going to get to Kirjath-Jerim. Thank you for joining me.